Divine Truth. Name of this presentation is Love Has Power Over Evil. And it is part of the Lessons in Love series. It was presented in Dallas, Texas, USA on the 18th of February 2012. This is Session 1, Part 1. So did you get to know each other, Lou? Yeah. Awesome. Very good. Sometimes you feel like, like uh, I don't know what you feel when, we, when you meet each other, but sometimes you feel like, I'm sure I know this person. <laughs> I'm sure I've had something to do with this person. And, uh, and for most of us, we certainly have had something to do with each other because of meeting in the sleep state at different times, so, yeah. Okay, so we're ready for our next subject. And um, by the way, I thought tomorrow afternoon too, we could, if some of you, obviously this is your first opportunity, many of you, to ask personal questions. And, uh, and so what I was thinking is tomorrow afternoon, if, there's, if, if during our discussion there's personal questions that come up that's similar to the subject at hand, feel free to ask them. But if uh, you find that there's not an opportunity, what we might try to do tomorrow afternoon is create an opportunity to answer some of your personal questions in the afternoon tomorrow. Uh, so that way we can have a mixture of different personal questions that can come up that uh, hopefully gives you the opportunity to resolve some of those issues personally. Um, so we thought that might be a good opportunity, being that this is the first time that we've met many of you and you haven't had those opportunities in the past. Okay. You're all fired up, Mike. Those little contraptions are pretty amazing. Aren't they? <laughs> okay, yes. No worries. <laughs> Good eye. All right, well, let's uh, talk about this subject. Lessons in love. This is a part of a series that I started when I was in Australia, um, talking about the different types of lessons in love. What we've already covered um, in Australia is lessons in love to do with loving yourself, then lessons in love to do with loving others. And today I'd like to cover this subject, love, Has power over evil. And I've purposely used the term evil because I'd like to define it, if we can do that. But if you think about the contrast between what the world views about love and what the world views about evil, what would you come up with? So, so let's, uh, I'll rub some of that off now that you know what the lesson is. So if we compare what the world views with lo of love and what the world's view of evil is in terms of their abilities to overcome the other, what, what are the basic beliefs can, can you see that the world has about, let's say, love firstly? Is love powerful enough to overcome evil? No. Most people in the world would say no. So, so what do they view love to be then? Sweet. So love is sweet, is it? Uh, insipid, some would say. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Weak. Sorry, weak? Vulnerable. Vulnerable. Caring. Caring. Chancy. Chancy. <laughs> risky. Shall I use the term risky? A fabrication of the mind. A fabrication of the mind. Many do, yeah, many have a, a, a very strong condescension, don't they? Mm -hmm. Towards love. How do you spell it here? Yes. 
It's for suckers. It's for suckers, yeah. yeah. So, lovely, so what would you say if we used a less colloquial term? <laughs> <laughs> for fools. For fools, yeah, love is for fools. Foolish. Yeah, so foolish. Foolish? foolish. Conditional? Uh, conditional? Blind. Love is blind, yes. Good. Impractical. Impractical. Power. Sorry? Power. Love is power. But does the world view that? Because if love was power. Well, the ego mind would say power was um, that you could force people to do things, but love is, is the power to create. Yep, but do most people on the planet believe that? I don't oh, I don't know what the uh, discussion <laughs> <laughs> I would say most people on the planet don't believe that. Unreliable. Unreliable is what a lot of people believe. How many, how many of you have had unreliable love in your life? <laughs> it's painful. Painful, yes. Sacrifice. Sacrifice, yes. Fleeting. Fleeting, yes. Hurtful. Hurtful, yes. Love hurts. Uh, irrational. Irrational, very good. Overwhelming. Overwhelming. Do most people let themselves ever be overwhelmed by love? Most people go, instead, what do they say? Is it, there's two different things people say about not letting yourself be overwhelmed by love. Controlling. So, if I just extend this idea a little bit, but first about how many of you allow yourselves to be overwhelmed by the love you feel on a day to day basis? So, that would tell me that there, there is a different viewpoint of love than it, than it being overwhelming. Does that make sense? So, so I, I do feel that for many of us, if we felt love fully, we would be overwhelmed. But most of us try to control that. We don't want to be overwhelmed. We want to be in control. Right? Um, so there's issues there. Distancing? And do most people feel that? I don't feel most people feel that. Intercourse? Sorry? Intercourse? So sex? Love is sex? Sex, <laughs> Limited. Limited in, in lots of different ways, eh? Can you see? We're starting to uh, get a bit of a picture. Earned. Earned, yeah. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Oh, yep, already there. Okay, so that's our view of love. Let's just rub people out. <laughs> Are you saying that you feel love is evil? <laughs> okay. Now, can you see there's a lot of pretty negative connotations in all of that, isn't there? If you look at honestly of what we view love to be, there is often some very negative connotations in what we view love to be. Right? We don't see love as a powerful force. We see love as all of these weak things, you know, that, that we see it as foolish and painful and hurting. And we've got all of these concepts about love that are really quite negative, actually. Can you see? So, so when I say love has power over evil, people go, what? Evil has power over everything, <laughs> is the viewpoint that most people have. And therefore, they believe it also has power over love. Yeah. So, can we see that we don't actually have, a, firstly, a good concept of love, but secondly, we don't have any concept of love's power. We, we actually, inbuilt in us now, because of all of these experiences we've had, and all of these experiences in, of life that, that have caused us to believe that love is something that's insipid and weak, we have this concept that, that, that love isn't something that is practical or reliable 
in day-to-day -day life. Right? We believe this. In our soul, we believe it. In our mind, we say to other people, love is everything. In our soul, we say, love is these things. <laughs> you see? Now, of course, that covers a lot of emotional hurt, doesn't it? These, these sta statements that we're making about love that many people on the planet feel demonstrate how hurt we are with love, how, how we have a very flawed concept of the whole idea of love. Yes? So bearing that in mind, that's our viewpoint of love. We don't see love as a powerful force in the universe. All right. Let's run that out. Yes. How do we see evil? Powerful. Self-centeredness. Right, so we see selfish. With a little ass. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Scary. Scary. Cruel. Cruel. Powerful. Powerful. Manipulative. Sorry? <coughs> Manipulative. Manipulative. Controlling. Good. Controlling. Inevitable. Inevitable. Omnipotent. Yes. Eternal. Yeah, it's going to be around forever. Enduring. Yep. Victorious. Yeah. Dark. We're often totally petrified of it, are we not? Yeah. yeah. Threatening. So we see it as a as threatening. Personified in some being. Dark. Yeah. Right, so we relate things like the devil, <coughs> demons to such a concept, don't we? Strong. Strong. Yeah, can you automatically start seeing a pattern here? Yeah. That, that there's a duality we feel yeah. about. Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. So what's the duality that we see about evil? On one hand, we see it as powerful, controlling, the way of the world. On the other hand, we see it as terribly scary. Like, Can you see how we sort of have this almost like a love-hate relationship with evil? Can you see that? When we talked about love, we sort of look down upon love in our souls. But when we talk about evil, can you see we almost have an adoration for it in some way? As well as a scary feeling whenever we think of it. So we sort of, sort of like we admire it, but at the same time hate it. Yes, that's how we often feel about evil. Okay. Now, can you see straight away that it's going to be very, very difficult for me if I have these concepts, the previous concept that was on the board about love, and this concept of evil, to ever believe that love has power over evil. You see? And my whole emotional state is going to be that I am going to be frightened at the thought that love could possibly have power over evil. I'm actually going to be actually terrified of accepting that concept. Because every, every bit of evidence that I think I've seen in my life seems to tell me the opposite. That evil has, is the thing that has power. That evil is the thing that controls. Evil is the thing that, demand, that demands its acceptance. Okay. Now, evil relies, and if I define, perhaps we need to define evil, which we will in a minute, but I'll just make a statement first, that evil relies on your fear of it in order to control you. Can you repeat that? 
Evil relies on your fear of evil to control you. If you were not afraid of evil, it could not control you. But for the majority of us, when we consider evil, we are terrified. So if we look at the base word, terror, it's a very interesting word that connotates a lot of things emotionally for us, doesn't it? Could we put dishonesty up there? Uh, evil, yes, certainly we can add dishonesty. Now let's look at the terror. What does the emotion of terror do? Well, it does one of three things generally, depending on its severity. So what are those three things? Do you know? Fight, flight, freeze. Exactly. So, so fight, so fear causes you to either fight or flee. Or... Freeze. That's what terror does emotionally to us. Right? Now, whenever we conceive evil, whether we're on the receiving end of it or on the giving end of it, we are generally involved in one of those three emotions. <laughs> Where we wish to fight we wish to flee, get away from a situation, or we just go into shock. Now, I've told this story before, but my father used to shoot uh, rabbits in Australia. Rabbits in Australia are treated as if they are like vermin. They were brought from the English a couple of hundred years ago to Australia, and before then, Australia didn't have rabbits. And so what happened was uh, the rabbits, when they first came, they very, very rapidly multiplied and there were literally billions of them in Australia, billions of them. And uh, they introduced a number of diseases, actually, to control them in Australia. Firstly, there was a disease called myxomatosis, and I can't remember the next disease. But these diseases killed billions of the rabbits in, in their holes, just to get rid of the rabbits. Because what the rabbits were doing was they were eating the bottom of all the trees, so much so that most of the trees, which weren't used to the rabbits doing so, most of the trees didn't have hard enough bark, and many of the trees died because they got ring barked at the bottom of, the, of all of these trees. And a lot of the, the native flora um, that relied on, and the native fauna that relied on these, the ecosystem, died as a result. And so it became a big issue. As a result of that, many people in Australia have a, have a deep hatred for any introduced species of animal, including rabbits. And my father is one of those. He, he had this hatred for it. Well, he just viewed them as a vermin that he could shoot. And he used to go out shooting them most uh, weekends, actually. And when I was a child, uh, we used to, I used to ride the motorbike, and he used to be on the back with his 22 rifle shooting rabbits while I was riding the motorbike. But when I was young, younger than that, uh, before I was born, in fact, he uh, described how there were so many rabbits that what they decided to do was that instead of, instead of shooting them, which actually put a hole in their skin, uh, which meant their skin was, their pelt was no longer very, very valuable, and it also put a hole in the flesh, which meant that they couldn't sell the rabbit for food very, uh, very easily. They had to cut off that area of flesh. So, so what they decided to do was to shoot over the top of the head of the rabbit. And the sound barrier crack would freeze the rabbit through terror. It would hear the sound barrier go, the, the bullet go past, the sound barrier crack of the, of the bullet, and it would instantly freeze. And you could actually walk up and pick up the rabbit. And then they'd slit the rabbit's throat or, and bleed it or whatever. The terror of just that sound caused the rabbit to go into a complete frozen state. Right? This is how many of us react to evil. We are so terrified of it that we're actually frozen in its presence. 
If we don't freeze, then we either attempt to do one of these other two things. We either attempt to flee it, to, to, to go away, run away from it, or we wish to fight it. The irony is that if we respond to evil in any one of those three manners, evil will continue. Mm -hmm. So if you try to flee evil, it will follow you. If you try to fight evil, it will grow. And if you freeze, it also grows. Because when you understand the psychology of evil, you start understanding why a person decides to be evil. And it's always about causing a person to be frightened so much that they either freeze, flee, flee or want to fight you. And you like every one of those things, if you're evil. Right. So, this is our normal response to evil. And if we respond in any way, one of these normal ways to evil, we are guaranteed evil will grow. And that's why evil has grown on the planet. Yeah. Oh, that's just wait does she need? Okay. Um, she probably does, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Karen. Just to um, I feel like there's a fourth way that I respond to evil sometimes, yeah. and that is possibly the worst. Denial? <laughs> No, I try to placate the evil by getting approval. Like I actually join in something that okay. is not loving for me um, because I, I'm so frightened. I just want to do anything to stop the... That is yeah, okay. placate like that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Placate evil. So you placate it or, yeah. or, or try to pander to it. Yeah, I try and make it happy. <laughs> <laughs> in order to go under the rate. Like, it's a fear response, I feel, yeah. but I feel it's the most damaging response I can have for my own soul because yeah. I'm, I'm actually, in some way, joining the, the damaging thing. Yes, yeah. this idea of placating evil is a great way to avoid one of these emotions or to avoid, in fact, this emotion. So, so what we finish up doing with evil on the planet is we, all, we justify its existence so much that we pander to it. Can you see how that happens in day-to-day -day life? You think of uh, you know, when the terror attacks happened in 9-11, right? There was evil there. For the, for the first time on, um, on the United States soil, and this concept that a person would die just to harm others was for the first time acted out in mass, on mass. Yep. Mind you, uh, it had been happening many other times in the United States if you look at it, because what about the War of Independence? Isn't that sort of a similar concept? But, uh, but unfortunately, you know, we've taken this event and turned it into something a bit larger than perhaps it is. And, but in the process, we, we learned that, okay, evil exists. Somebody who conceived of that particular event obviously had a lot of evil within them, whoever it was that conceived of the event. And for that reason, we then decide that we're going to do something with it. Now, what was America's choice? To fight it. Um, and <clears throat> what is the choice of uh, somewhere like um, Iraq? What, what did they choose with that evil? Didn't they choose to placate it? Can you see that? Didn't they choose to support the people who were involved in it, placate it, like panda to the people who supported it. What about other countries in the Middle East? They felt the same, didn't they, at the time? And not only other countries in the Middle East, there were, there were other, other things. What did other countries recommend? So United Nations, before the war actually occurred in Iraq, 
what did the United Nations recommend? Can you remember? They it really <coughs> recommended this, didn't they? Placating it. Yeah. So what I'm trying to illustrate is that every form of uh, every response that mankind generally has to evil every response that mankind has to evil is mostly about either doing these things and has any of it eradicated evil? So that tells me that placating evil does not work. It tells me that going into a frozen state doesn't work. It tells me that fleeing it doesn't work because it just follows you. And it tells me that fighting it doesn't work either because all that happens is evil grows when you fight it. So what works? Can you see why we believe nothing works and therefore evil is the most powerful thing? Can you see that? The reason why I mentioned um, dishonesty before yep. is that I think any time we're dishonest about anything, it opens the door for um, a weakening position and evil moves in. And it seems like every time honesty is presented, uh, evil runs and hides. Okay, so truth is sort of an antidote. Yeah, there you go. If we could call it that. And so we'll we'll, write, we'll talk about that in this discussion actually, in terms of a lesson of love. Yeah. So can we see that the average way we handle evil does not work? And what I'm going to propose is that there's only one thing that works. It's that weak thing that we just... <laughs> <laughs> so let's look at love again. That's that thing. That's the only thing that works. Now, to understand how it works, we need to understand the psychology of evil. We need to understand how evil thinks. That makes sense, does it not? If we understand how evil thinks, then we can find the appropriate antidote to it and apply that to it and see through, through experience, through testing it, through experimentation, whether it works or not. Right? So let's look at how evil thinks. Or you could call it the psychology of evil you want it to be, use longer words. So what is the psychology of evil? What, what causes a person to become evil? What causes a person to... Well, let's even define evil for a, for a moment, shall we? Should we attempt to define it? In terms of what is it really? What is evil really? Katerina, would you like to...? I was feeling that evil is a bully, actually. Okay, it's a bully, yeah. Which means to me that it kind of so puts up a mean? front. It puts up a mean front, but it's not actually going to do... It um, does often do what it threatens to do. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it, evil? Yeah. In fact, that's the whole problem. Yeah. It's not just a threat, it's an actual action. But let's look at the word bully. Like, what, what, is, what, is, what are we saying about evil in that regard? It terrorises you. It's, it... Um, so its purpose, the purpose is to what? Terrorize? And overpower? Compel and feed on fear. To compel, yes, very good. To dominate. Dominate. Control. Control. To have its way. Yep, so it demand, it's demanding, isn't it? It demands its wants. To quell its own fears. Sorry? To quell its own fears. Uh, yeah, but that's the underlying motivation of it, shall we say. Just destroy. So we'll talk about the underlying motivation in a minute. Yeah. Destroy. Destroy, yes, very important. And does it care whether it destroys the person who's evil or the other person? No. It's not often very selective, is it? Like, often <coughs> you're destroying yourself while you're evil as well. And it doesn't seem to matter. Yeah. Anything else? 
perhaps self-fulfillment, small self-fulfillment. In other words, it, it just doesn't care what it does to others as long as it gets what it wants. So let's call it selfish. Mm. To hide the truth. So mm. its object is to hide the truth. Yeah. What about instant gratification? Very good. Yeah. Instant gratification. That's what it expects, isn't it? It expects you to meet its demands immediately. Yep. Without question, without any form of like pondering about it or thinking about it or thinking about whether you want to or not, none of that. So it's totally the opposite to free will in a way, isn't it? We, we don't, we're not going to have free will with in the face of evil often times. That's how evil thinks. Evil wants to create no free will. It wants to have it. No free will, except, except for, for itself. itself. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? It can enjoy. Uh, sorry, if we can, hands, if we can, uh, I can just. Uh, what about somebody who's confused between evil and love? For instance, um, they do an evil act towards another person. They say, I did it because I love them. Yeah. So would evil be confusing a person? Or something, how would you... Can you say it, it self-justifies? Okay. Yeah. Manipulates. And manipulates, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... How, by the way, how many of you, just as a personal question, and I know these are personal questions that are sometimes a bit confronting, but how many of you have thought about when somebody crossed you in love, you know, when somebody... You know, did you, you're in a relationship. I did. They <laughs> cheated. You're ready for it. You're in a relationship, and um, somebody you feel harmed you in love. How many of you have thought about trying to get them back? Not get them back into your life, but get them back and make them feel the same pain you felt. Yeah. How many of you would have loved to see that happen? Yeah. Oh, right. oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So can you see how many of us do have the underlying emotion that creates the evil tendency sitting within us? Yeah? And so there is a belief on the earth that man is inherently evil. Yeah? Isn't it? That I do. There's this underlying belief. Okay. I do. What the God? So, so... <coughs> That's the underlying feeling of evil. Evil is trying, basically, to control. It's trying to gain a control and ascendancy, isn't it? It wants what it wants. <coughs> That's how evil thinks. So what does it do when it thinks these things? If that's how evil thinks, what does it evil eventually do? It looks for someone who... Is susceptible to someone that can influence? If we can just say it again. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Put up your hand because then it gives time for Carolyn to come to the mic. It looks for someone it can influence. <laughs> it does? Yeah. Someone who is susceptible to it, who, who can be manipulated. Yes, I agree totally. Good. Um. It seems like it sucks energy off. It gets people afraid and then sucks energy off of it. So it feeds on the fear of others. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah I agree. Totally. Anything else that you can think of? Yep, yeah, Jennifer, this is straight behind you. Right. <laughs> it controls the information that gets out to, to perpetuate that fear thing. It does, yep, yeah, certainly. Yep. Yeah. If we come across. Uh, uh, to the, what was your name? The man in the <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Carol. You, you had your name, your hand on. Oh, no, no. No, oh, sorry. Carol. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Oh, right, sorry. <laughs> Carol is on the ball. And I, was <laughs> um, I was just going to say it can create shame when, if you were to think something like some of the stuff that you're asking, I've thought about stuff like that before. I didn't necessarily act it out every time, but I have had an initial thought of something like that, and that can create like a 
like a shame in yourself that you would be able to think something like that. Yes, and so if you have shame in yourself that's unresolved, can you see how easy it is to manipulate your shame as well? Yeah. Like if, if I decided to manipulate your shame, if I knew what your shame was, then that would be an evil act, wouldn't it? <coughs> Basically, it would be an act that would harm you. But, uh, but that's what evil often does. Evil often manipulates the shame of others. Yes? Lawrence? It's motivated by greed. Uh, in what way? Greed in what way, Lawrence? I just thinking? wants it all. Oh, okay. Wants everything. Not wants just everything. money, but, yeah. but everything. Power, Power, money. control. Yep. Yep. Everything. Yeah. Done. It takes pleasure in everyone else's pain. It does. This is a very important part that I want to write down. Just, it takes pleasure in others' pain. We want to come back to that. Because we want to see why we would do that. Why we would have a longing to take pleasure in others' pain. Aren't they just hurt to begin with? The person, the person who's, who's, who's at, allowed things to reside in their I in hearts. I agree. But just... what we're trying to do is just look at... See, see a lot of times when, we, when we're faced with evil in our life, day-to-day -day life, we don't think, oh, that person is just sad. Or we don't think, oh, that person's just, like, you know, got a lot of fears of their own. Most of the time, we're in a totally different phase when we're faced with it in our personal life. We don't have any depth of, like, in our uh, thinking, in, in a place when we can be reasonable, we often go, oh, well, they must have uh, some sadness or they must have some fear of their own in order for them to take such an action. So we go like that intellectually. But then when someone comes along and murders your child, in that situation, you're now not thinking, oh, he must have had you know, some sadness in him, or he must have... You're not, not thinking that anymore, are you, in that moment? And this is what we've got to do with evil. We've got to see that the emotion, and this happens to all of us, the emotions we feel take over the intellect. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. What we need to do is address the emotions that take over the intellect that cause us to act in, a, in our response to evil, whether we fight it or whatever we do to it. It's our emotions that take over the intellect in the process. And so unless we face the emotions inside of us that, that cause us to take over our intellect, we're, when we get put in the situation, no amount of intellectual reasoning before that point will help us. We need to see that we need to address something emotionally to, to, to cure this issue. Do you suppose, H.A., that it's a, a deep down, it's, it's um, the evil is trying to achieve security for itself through controlling others? I agree. Most evil has as its cause a deep sense of fear of its own. Mm -hmm. yeah? But uh, unfortunately, the person who perpetrates evil is not thinking that at the time they're yeah. perpetrating mm -hmm. evil. They're already in the, what I would call the higher level emotion, not in the base emotion that creates it. So we'll, we'll look at its structure in a minute in terms of the different emotions that create evil. Um, because it, we need to come to understand it to understand how love combats it. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? We need to understand evil to be able to then understand how love can overcome it, how love can, has power over it. Yep. Any other comments you'd like to make about evil itself, how, how it thinks and what it does? Yep. Um, it tries to separate us from love? It always tries to separate us from love. In fact, what it does most of the time is tell us that love has no power. No, love has no power. It's interesting when we speak with spirits in the hells of the spirit world because every single spirit who comes to speak generally believes that love has no power. They only believe in evil. They only believe that evil is the thing with power. In fact, many of them are doing this. If I can describe it to you as a picture. Imagine this is the spirit who's in the hells. And in fact, I probably should just put that spirit here. That's the spirit who's in the hells. So uh, today we had some women spirits who are in the hells come to speak with us. 
and those women spirits were um, had been harmed when they were on earth, they'd been sexually abused and, and raped on earth, they'd had a sexual violence perpetrated towards them, they'd died during the sexual violence and then they passed in the spirit world and they uh, wanted to talk to us about evil, about how they, why shouldn't they be continually afraid of evil. Interestingly enough, those spirits have even darker spirits surrounding them, who are men's spirits, who are the same kind of spirits as the people on earth who actually caused their own death. Right? Even in a darker location. And these spirits are even motivated by some even darker spirits. So instead of them feeling that love rules the spirit world, which it does, and we'll describe how maybe later, they believe that evil rules the spirit world, and the more evil you are, the more power you have. That's their belief. And the very darkest of these spirits are the people who control the financial and political systems of this earth. The very darkest of these spirits. And they use forms of threats and blackmail and so forth of potential events to get these people to do the harm to these people. Do you understand? These people here, even the ones who are harming these, are totally frequently guided by even darker people who are more threatening to them. They are more frightened of them than they are of anything else. So fear is a huge factor in evil, even when a person, after a person has passed. Yeah. I've kind of... Um, Just wait for the mic to come down. Well, it, it's kind of um, disheartening to think that not only are we fighting this on earth in the physical yes. but now you're saying we've got all, all this other you know energy around us and yes. that's sort of well, that's, that's disheartening what, yeah disheartening is a good word there's another word that we often feel when i start a discussion like this and that is hopeless, hopeless. right yep yep these are often feelings that come up in a discussion now, I'm not saying all these things to totally dishearten you and make you feel completely hopeless. However, they are emotions. These are often the emotions we feel when we face the truth of evil on the planet and the truth of evil in the spirit world. In the first dimension of the spirit world, so there's other dimensions in the spirit world, lots of them, but the first dimension of the spirit world is almost totally populated by people who believe in evil. When I say believe in evil... Their primary belief system is that evil is the most powerful force. Now, there are some of them who are petrified of that, and there are some of them who love that. But collectively, they believe that evil and terror are, is the most powerful force. So when we come to talk with them, the spirits, they feel the same thing you feel. Heart, disheartened, hopeless. They just feel like there's no other way than to pander to it. We have to band to it, we have to fight it, we have, we have to do something. One of those things that we mentioned earlier. Yep. To, to stop ourselves from feeling those feelings, actually. Okay. So what do we do? And do you suppose, if, if indeed, just wait you know, the these people just are wait, trying... Can you wait for the mic? Yes, these people are trying... Evil, we'll say evil, whether it's people or spirits or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, if they're trying to gain security by controlling others, perhaps really all they did is they need real love in their lives. I agree. And that's the answer for them, right? It is the answer, but... We now have to define real love. Because remember when we wrote love on the board up there before? Yeah, yeah that one doesn't <laughs> that's work. That's our opinion of love. It's not very impressive. And that didn't seem very powerful to me. Let's take over on that one. That's, 
<laughs> so, so, so that's the issue we face, is that, that real love potentially has the way to solve this problem, theoretically, and we, we need to find out how. To, to be practical about the discussion, we need to come up with practical circumstances and situations to demonstrate how real love can solve the problem. But we need to know what real love is. It's no good thinking that real love is insipid, weak, and all those kind of things, because real love isn't any of those things. But it's what we believe real love is. And unfortunately, because we believe real love is like that, we then feel that it has no power. So the, the problem we face is that when we talk about this evil versus good discussion, and I find it very fascinating because Hollywood, Hollywood is awesome. <laughs> Honestly. The reason why is it's a reflection of what we as a society believe about these things. Right? And what do you see in most Hollywood movies? Good always prevails. Good always prevails. So, and let's define good. What does Hollywood define good as? Superhero. Well, no, no. Fighting back. Ah, yes, yes, yes. They're the ones who fight back with righteousness on their side. Isn't that the de definition? Semi-automatic. A semi-automatic gun. <laughs> or an automatic rifle. Killing all the evil ones. And then the good triumphs. Is that what we're talking about here? I don't think so. <laughs> all right, so, so even Hollywood's definition of good, I would actually classify it as evil. <laughs> That's what I was feeling. Oh, can you wait for the mic to? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's what I was feeling before about this placating issue. I feel almost in society we, it's such a common injury that we almost now lord things that are evil. We we we're so afraid that we kind of these people that have power, like a lot of people who are regarded as celebrities, do some pretty dark things. But we almost worship them, and Hollywood is based on this. If I'm a big, strong man who's prone to violence, I'm actually hot. Yeah. <laughs> and so the, I feel like there's this real societal... Uh, that shows how much we want to placate to evil. Yes. Yeah. In fact, it's very interesting because even a lot of sexual attraction on Earth is not actually about true attraction, but it's actually about how much the man will protect me. From evil. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Mm. We're actually wanting the man to be partly evil so that he can protect me from evil. Yeah. And a man who's like that is viewed as a good man. He's a good man. He's a good man if he reverts to violence with a just cause. That makes him good. Of course, the definition of a just cause varies widely depending on the circumstances. And sometimes the just cause just gets down to my cause, or whatever that is. Yeah. But this is the problem, is even a lot of what we view as an attractiveness on the planet is all about placating evil. It's all about whether this person will be able to placate evil. And if he, is, if he can, then I, I'm attracted to him. Or if he can fight evil, I'm attracted to him. If he runs away from evil, what do I feel? He's weak. He's weak, insipid. Yeah? And if, he, he, if he's a... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? person who doesn't go to war is called pacifist. Pacifist, yeah, sorry. And so if he's a pacifist, what do I feel? He's great. He's got no courage. I think he's great. Yeah. Do you know um, in the Second World War, there were a group of people in your country, America, who refused to go to the Second World War. The majority of them got tarred and feathered and put in jail. Why? I 
unpatriotic? Because not going to war was viewed as unpatriotic, unpatriotic and Cowardly. weak, cowardly. cowardly, and so forth. Yep. So interesting, isn't it, that, that we even societally have this viewpoint that evil is the only thing that can overcome evil. But we don't call it evil. We call it good. And the reason why we call it good, it's just the same as evil. It has the same actions. It's still violent, but it's righteous. It's righteous violence. Right's on your side, so you can be violent if right's on your side. That's the viewpoint. Is it working? No. 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 So it doesn't work. But that's what we view it. That's what we, we view it as. It's interesting that if you compare evil with good for most people in their mind, both of them are violent, but one is unrighteous. In other words, one of them is defined as wrong. Now, for each society, the definition of wrong differs. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, in your society, the definition of wrong is a Muslim with a machine gun. In a Muslim society, the definition of wrong is America with an atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. Can you see the definition of righteous versus unrighteous just differs depending on the vocation. But both resort to mm -hmm. violence. Both. Both reward is it about the It's entertaining and it's both of them Fire away. That was just a joke though. Well, it's entertaining in itself. It, it's entertaining in itself. In the in the movies perhaps, but it's yeah. not very entertaining in real life. Correct. In real life it hurts. Um, I was gonna say that it seems that one of the, the inherent problems with trusting love is that we can see violence. You can see the overpowering of something, mm -hmm. you can see the action, but with love it's like it happens behind the scenes with God's laws and they're invisible. So it's hard to trust, or it's hard to develop the trust in love, because it's kind of, it happens in the invisible realm as opposed to right in front of your face someone's dying. Yeah, I can't whatever. agree with that, Jennifer. Okay. And I understand that's the conception that many of us have. Mm -hmm. But yeah. the reason why we have this conception is because none of us have really seen love on the planet really at this point. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we then we then start to see, we start feeling love is sort of like an invisible force, but love isn't like that. It's actually a very, very powerful force and we'll talk about the power in it as we go along in our discussion today and tomorrow. But if I can just go back to this idea about violence, if we can for a moment, let's look at what we're basically saying on the planet is that if the violence is righteous, then the person who conducts it is good. We're saying that if the violence is unrighteous, or in other words, doesn't have right on its side, then it's evil. But I would like to say all violence. is evil. In other words, no, there is no such thing as unrighteous or righteous violence. It is all unrighteous violence. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, many of us inside of ourselves emotionally have yet to come to that conclusion. Many of us, at our, at our deepest, darkest moments, many of us do feel there is a justification for resorting to violence. Now, can I give you, before you put it up, <laughs> can I give you one major way that we view this? For those of you who have had children, if someone come along and harmed your child, how would you feel? How many of you feel at the moment you'd possibly resort to violence? See? See? Yeah. The reality is the majority of us would possibly resort to violence in that situation. Yeah. 
if we had the opportunity to, if, if there was no law against it. If there's a law against it, now we want the state to resort to violence for us. Isn't that the same thing? Yeah. Just somebody else doing it for us, so therefore we're asking the state to be, in my definition, evil, just so that I don't have to feel that I am. That's the reality. Yep. Okay. I just, this goes back to the Old Testament, an yep. eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Some, some very strong uh, religious flavour to this good versus evil discussion. The eye for an eye, which, by the way, is in both the Christian Bible and the Koran. <laughs> Interestingly. <laughs> right? Eye for an eye. And as Gandhi said, makes the Oh, oh, well, blind. Yes. Because the, the reason why it does is because if I take out your eye, there's no other, you know, then it, you won't be able to see to take out mine. And so what you end up doing is taking out somebody else's, generally, if you resort to that bias. You probably can define, define violence, but. So in that case there, evil versus good, if you stop violence, is that violence? If you Like someone you said is harming your child or something like that. Yep. If you stop them, is that violence? When you say, is that what you're saying? When you stop them, what, what do you mean by stopping them? I don't know. Someone's going to throw a rock at them, <laughs> and you stop them from throwing the rock. So, how so you, however you stop them, is that violence also? How is that you, what you're saying? How you grab you, their arm and, you know, peel the rock out of their hand, say. So that's maybe, just a small example. That's but restriction. Is, okay, so that's not violence. Well, it depends how far you take it, doesn't it? I suppose it does, but, yeah. Yeah. you know, so, how far do you take it to say that you're reacting or the good guy is reacting with violence? Yeah, uh, it's a very good question, and we'll, we'll discuss that question. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's a very good question. Because it, it, the, the reality is, for the majority of us, we feel there should be some form of restriction of an evil act. That's well, right. I mean, if you're saying that any restriction, if you're saying that any restriction, you're not saying that restriction is violent then. Depends, okay. depends how, it's, <laughs> okay. how it's done. Yeah. Yeah. So if restriction is dropping an atomic bomb on somebody, oh. then of course <laughs> that's very violent. If restriction is get out an automatic weapon or, or a knife or something else, then that's very that's violent. But restriction can take other forms. Yeah. So I'm not I'm not saying for the I'm not saying that it's not an unloving act. I'm using too many knots there. Yeah. So, <laughs> and I'll, I'll try and put it clearer. And I'm not saying that if we restrict a person, that that is an act of violence. I'm saying that how we restrict the person can be an act of violence, depending on what we choose to do. So, for example, placing a person in a prison because they have been violent to society is not an act of violence. Placing the person in a prison without giving them any assistance to change is more of an act of violence towards the person. So it just depends on the degree of what, what we take as to what becomes violent or not in terms of our actions. And, so, and, and we can get to a discussion about defining violence, but I'm just using some sort of fairly free, open sort of concepts at this point to discuss how evil, how we view evil more, more, more than what kind of individual action <coughs> we take in individual circumstances at this point. <laughs> um, when someone's using their free will disharmonious with love, I think we often feel like it might be okay to violate their free will in order to sort of enforce um, being harmonious with love, But if that makes sense. But uh, the truth is that any violation of free will is disharmonious with love. So no, you I can't do I, that. I don't agree with that. You don't? No. Um, not, not under all circumstances. 
because if the person exercises, like if you look at a society on earth, if a person exercises their free will in order to harm others, then they're not respecting the fact that the other's free will are now, now being impacted. So it, the, the issue becomes an issue of balance. Do you understand by what I mean by balance? If I'm harming your will, then I, I should not expect to not have my own will restricted. That would be a just thing, would it not? Okay. So, so I can't expect to have not have my own will restricted if I'm harming your will. Right? And I don't feel that's a fair thing to expect. Mind you, a lot of people on earth expect it, but, but it's not a fair thing to expect. If I harm your will, surely a society that has love as its primary goal would then look at restricting my will so that your will cannot be harmed. But it's how we go about the restriction that is the issue. Yeah? And this is also applies to countries. Right? So, for example, in, uh, at the moment in, in uh, Africa, in the Sudan, uh, for example, there are literally like millions of displaced people who are displaced because of the violence surrounding them and they've removed themselves from that violence, they've fled from that violence, and they are now in camps on the borders of Sudan or in, in other countries like Chad and so forth around Sudan. Now, at face value, it appears that the way to resolve this problem would be to somehow restrict the people who are being violent towards those people. But there are a number of very, other, uh, very highly effective other alternatives that we are, as a society, unwilling to take. That it actually would be more loving to both parties. So, for example, one thing would be don't supply guns to the people who are being violent. That would be a restriction that if the US government chose to take, the US government is the largest arms manufacturer on Earth, if it chose to take that one restriction, right, then it would automatically severely restrict or curtail their activity. Right? Second thing is every, if every government on the planet who was in a peaceful state chose to airlift all of those victims of the violence to their country with no restriction, then there'd be nobody for those particular people to harm, would there not? They'd either have to harm themselves or search for something else to do. But they've got no guns now to do it with, and they've got no people to harm either. But why don't we accept them? Why don't we, in other countries who are well off and affluent, accept the people who are being harmed? Because we have our own fears of a lack of abundance and so forth that cause us to take the action that we feel we can't actually airlift them out. We have, on the planet, we have the, air, the resources to airlift millions of people if we wanted to. Within a, mo within a few weeks. Like, if we really were concerned about resolving the issue. But the reality is, the majority of us are not really concerned about resolving the issue because we're worried about how this issue may pan out if we resolve it. We're not willing to take action because of fear. A lot of it's our own fear of our own lack of abundance. So, so what I'm suggesting is, if we're looking at practical solutions, which you raised, Eric, if you look at practical solutions, there are many practical solutions that can restrict the people who are being violent. That doesn't mean killing them. And it doesn't mean like physically harming them. But there are many practical solutions that we can take that would severely curtail their activity. But the problem on the planet is we, are, we have a lot of governments which are our own creation, uh, we're the people that create the governments that actually do not wish to curtail their activity because they have their own agendas in place and some of their own agendas is we want to sell arms a third of your economy here one third of your economy is about arms manufacture if, if, if the American government decided today to never make another gun, tank, bomb, whatever 
a third of your economy would just fall, the, the bottom of your economy would just fall out of itself. Are you prepared for that? You see, the majority aren't. And the government knows that. You see? Now, if you look at the five biggest arms gun runners on the planet, they are all governments. Every one of them is government. The United States government, the Russian government, are the two biggest. The Chinese government, the French government, the German government. <laughs> They're all governments. Right? They are all governments providing the <coughs> arms to the people who are perpetrating violence. Right? And so there's a huge national and, and worldwide movement on the part of Western nations, in particular, to perpetrate violence in order to sell these arms. They love the threat of fear because then we can sell more guns. We can sell more arms. And these are, these are areas that we need to look at, emotionally look at, as a society, if we wish to change this issue. Can you see there's quite severe issues with it? I have another solution that might work. Of course, it's not going to happen anyway. Neither, neither is yours, but they're great solutions. Yeah. Is that if we, first of all we stop selling them bullets? Yeah. Okay, that's a good start. That's a great then try and figure out what are they fighting about. <laughs> exactly. And then you would find that they're being manipulated by somebody. Exactly. And then they could say, "Oh, that's it," and quit fighting. Yep. So truth has a lot to do with it. Well, they're being lied to from somebody. Exactly. Exactly. So, Otherwise, why would they be killing their own people? And also, there's a personalization of global issues. Um, your government did this with you in 9-11. They personalized the issue to be a part of each one of you emotionally. Yes? And our government did the same. We, we went ahead with Iraq in Australia, exactly the same as you guys did. And, and the government personalized the issue. They tried to make it into a an issue of your own personal safety and security. Now, don't you think there's clever people on the opposite side of the world doing exactly the same thing mm -hmm. against your government? <laughs> of course. Right? And this is what we need to, uh, to, to actually deal with. So, so let's get back to this issue of love combating evil. So we're not talking about... I'm not talking about the world's definition of good. Because the world's definition of good is if you're evil but righteous, that's, that's good. That's the world's definition of good. Does that make sense? So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, firstly, that's the statement I'd like to make, but secondly, I'm talking about love being the cure. But we need to see how love is the cure. Does that make sense? If we don't see how love is the cure, then it's impossible for us to actually embrace it as a feeling in us that we want to actually address. You see, at the moment, you, we, you remember all the things we wrote down about love? Right at the beginning. The net result of all of those things is we viewed love as weak. Didn't we, didn't we not? We viewed love as hurts, pain, weak, all these other things, that's what we viewed love as. Now that kind of a love is not going to be the cure for anything. It's not, it's not going to be the cure for our own unhappiness, let alone the unhappiness of the world. Right? We need to actually see what kind of a love is going to be required to cure these problems. That makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. So, all of you intelligent people, <laughs> well educated, <laughs> so what kind of love is going to solve the problem? Now, don't go bandying terms around with me <laughs> without defining them. Like, what do you mean by unconditional love? What do you mean by that? <laughs> well, can we, can we look at it from a... Let me put a scenario to you. A, a person comes to, to you and to your family. They barge into your home. 
they put all of your children at gunpoint, right? And they threaten you to do something. They threaten you to to maybe maybe you're a bank manager and they threaten you to open the bank, right? Or whatever. Now, initially, you might refuse, right? Initially, you might refuse. So, what do they do? Shoot one of your kids. Well, they might just threaten to shoot one of your kids. <laughs> right? They might just threaten to shoot one of your kids. Now, the threat causes what emotions in you? Fear. 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 Anger. Fear. Anger. Fear. Right? Desire for revenge, perhaps. Right? But bearing in mind the guy's got the gun and he's threatening, he seems serious, he's threatening to shoot your child, what would you probably do in the moment? Submit. You'd probably submit, yes? You'd probably submit to his demand. So you give him the code to the bank vault, he opens the bank, and then he shoots all of the family anyway. That's what evil would do, isn't it? Evil would probably do that. And because evil doesn't have any... What do you call it? Conscience. Conscience, or it doesn't have any integrity either, does it? It doesn't have any integrity of like, I'll agree to do something and then I'll stick to my word. It doesn't say that. So evil would go ahead anyway. Now, let's say though that they decided to kill that child anyway. And how would you feel? Would you feel unconditional love? <laughs> That's the question I'm asking you. Now, can you see the majority of us would not? Right? We'd feel a desire for revenge, a desire maybe to even attack the person involved if we could. We'd, find, we'd try to find a way to harm the person in the way they've harmed us. And there's even been cases where a person has tried to find their own children and harm their children once because their own child was harmed. In other words, what we finish up trying to do is create the same pain as has been created in ourselves. Now, why would we choose to do such a thing? Why would we choose to create the same pain in another person as what has been already created in us? As sort of a commiseration, like, so you know how I feel, sort of? Feel? So, yeah, the underlying thing is, you know how I feel yeah. now. Right? That's the underlying emotion. But why would we choose to do that? There's an underlying driving force that causes us to choose to create the same pain in another that's already within ourselves. I have no idea. <laughs> we didn't work we need through to find it. it, don't we? Yeah. So we don't have to feel our own pain? So we don't have to feel our own pain. So, so can you see? The underlying choice we've made is to not, to not feel our own pain but to make somebody else feel it. To, to, to put the pain on somebody else. Right? To force another to feel the pain. And, and we want them to feel the same type of pain most of the time, don't we? Your, I don't know if you remember the speech that President Bush gave after 9-11. Can you remember he actually included words very similar to that? That, that we are going to force the other person, the people who perpetrated this, are going to regret their choices, basically. We are going to perpetrate the same kind of pain. Now, is that unconditional love? No. no, no. Okay. But that is what most of us feel. Most of us feel that we'd like to do that if we're honest with ourselves. You see? 
So can you see that for love to be unconditional, there has to be some kind of change within our own heart that would would cause it would cause us to not resort to these actions. Can you see that? Yeah. So what we're going to do tomorrow is discuss some things about real love and some basic principles about real love that can overcome all evil. Right? We're going to break them, if we get the time, we're going to break them firstly into love of self, <coughs> some areas of love of self that we need to embrace if we're going to prevent evil. There is also some issues that we need to raise regarding love of others that we need to embrace if we're going to prevent, prevent evil. And we are also going to need to have a love of truth in order to prevent evil. Now you notice that we don't necessarily need a love of God to prevent evil. In the sixth dimension of the spirit world, there are many spirits who don't believe in God at all. And yet, the sixth dimension is a place where there is no evil. Right? So you don't necessarily need God's love to prevent evil. However, if you have love of God enter your heart, you actually automatically grow in that area in that area and in that area. So if God's love enters your heart, you can automatically change in how much love you have of yourself, how much love you have of others, and how much love you have of the truth. And so therefore, receiving the love of God can actually do a great deal to change this concept of evil on the planet and turn it around, you know, to, to actually learn how to love. So what I would like for you guys to do if you feel up to it tonight is to have a bit of a think about what love of self really means and how the proper love of self would combat evil. What love of others really means and how the love of others would combat evil. And what love of truth really means and how that would combat evil. You reckon you could do that? Yeah. And we can, tomorrow at 10, we can come up with some ideas about, you know, that you've come up with with regard to what the love of self and love of others and love of truth really means to us. And what we would like to do is, is to put it to the test in, like, some example situations. Does that make sense? To see what would happen if we were confronted with evil and we decided to follow some of the advice you want to give tomorrow. <laughs> yeah? And if we can do that, I reckon we'll finish up understanding at a lot more soul level the power of love over evil. Yeah, yeah I have a question yep. uh, regarding evil and violence. And if we eat meat, um, does it already... <coughs> Is it already some kind of violence because we uh, are the reason why animals get slaughtered and so you're saying raised it, it, in a way which is very unloving? Is that violence? Yeah, as a part of violence, yeah. Yep. Yep. Certainly, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So is eating meat... And what's that book, babe, that, uh, that guy? It's called Eating Animals. Eating Animals, yeah. What's it, who's it by? Jonathan Safran Troyer. He's an American, isn't he? American. Yeah. There's a really Jewish. good book, actually, called Eating Animals. By, he's, a, he's a PhD, isn't he? Um, uh, yeah, I think he is. Um, do you remember his name? O'Brien? O'Brien, is it? No. Safran. F-R-O-E-R, I think it's all you are. Oh, well, I'll give you the right details tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. It's a very good book, by the way. There's lots of statistics yeah. in it about the relationship 
to, to killing animals and killing humans. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of relationships you'll find. So he, he has all of this statistical analysis, literally 30 years of research that he's done, and heaps, heaps of research in China and other places as well about the health and all. It's, all, it's very fascinating read anyway. Um, but I agree, Rita, that there is certainly issues of these things in the issue with regard to even eating meat. And, and certainly if a society eats meat easily, um, there is certainly a larger tendency to violence in the society, which is an interesting correlation. Yeah. Thank you. Statistically, it's actually proven that there is a larger incidence of violence in societies that eat meat. When you're closing, I just want to... Isn't there a correlation between circumcision and violence in society as well? Yes, of course there is. Yeah. There's quite a lot of correlations to violence perpetrated towards males in their childhood and how violence comes out as adults, certainly. Okay. Yeah. There is also a larger incidence of violence uh, between of, of men that have been brought up by mothers. Men that have been brought up with only mothers in the household, no father in the household, have a larger incidence of violence. 96, sorry, 94%, I think it is, in the States, 94% of men in, in prison for violent crimes have been brought up by mothers. Interesting. It's an interesting... Yeah, just back for a minute to evil. Yep. Is the, well, it's kind of a two-piece thing I wanted yes. to say. One is, um, so like the whole New Age movement talks about, like they sort of minimize that evil is even real kind of a thing. Yes, this which is, is so huge. Yeah. So there's this like relief about like, okay, this is real. And then part two is, is the reason that we have evil, does that come from self-reliance? The underlying core belief, yes, is yeah. all to do with self-reliance. But we, we need to see the structure of self-reliance, which was one thing I'd hope, hope to achieve tomorrow with you, is to help you understand the structure of self-reliance and how it infects every aspect of our belief systems. And there is also a lot of information that, if you think about it tonight a bit as well, if you think about how, <coughs> the, how evil itself is created through the actions of others who are not either loving themselves, loving others, or loving the truth at the time. So if you can have a think about that as well. So we've all created evil. Sorry? We've created evil. And mankind, mankind has created, has created yes, evil. Yes. God created the potential of its existence by creating free will. So free will, which is a gift given to us as beings that if we, if we didn't have free will, we would all be robots. Right? So, so, so God had a choice to create robots or create free will sentient thinking beings. But the problem with creating a free will, free will is that there is the potential for the person to use their free will in a violent manner. And all these spirits sitting in the house that want to keep perpetuating evil, yep. so we... We need to know that they're there, but their purpose is because they don't want to deal with their emotion, and so they, they keep wanting to sort of infect the hum humankind. Well, what we'd like to do tomorrow is analyse their purpose. Okay. Does that make right. sense? So rather good. than sort of jumping to a conclusion, mm -hmm. okay. what we'd like to do is, through your own investigation, we want to look at these areas of love and go, okay, in these areas of love, um, how is it that it results in evil? if a person doesn't feel a certain thing or doesn't, you know, what, the things that you come up with in terms of what is a love of self and what is love of others and what is love of truth, and then what we need to do is find a correlation between those loves and how they would actually physically combat evil if we actually lived those loves. So remember, that, remember when we started this discussion today that when I wrote down love on the board and I then asked you for the world's idea of what love is and what are the different emotions you feel about love, almost all of the emotions that came up were all about weakness and insipidness and, and all of these other types of feelings. So, so the reality is the majority of us 
have this idea still that love isn't very powerful. We have this idea that love is weak, you know, easy to manipulate, easy to control. We see love as a problem, really, don't, do we not? So, so the issue we face then is if love is the, if we believe love is a problem, then we're not having a very good definition of love. So what, what I'm asking you to do tonight is to look at your own definition of what love of self means. See, some people would say love of self means getting whatever I want whenever I want it. Now, I would say that's not what love of self means. But, but we need to look at and examine our own definitions of love. The reason why we need to do that is we often justify actions that are violent based on love. So I would say we often justify evil based on love and obviously it's not love then if it's justifying evil so so we need to have a good examination of ourselves in this process so what I'd like to do tomorrow and we might get a chance we'll definitely get a chance to look at those the love of self and hopefully we'll get a chance to look at those I would like to look at it all but but in two hours or so tomorrow that we have the chance to do it there are so many things to discuss in that area um, where the principles, the true principles of love have the ability to, to cure all evil on the planet, actually. And, and if we can... But we need to understand what that real love is. And so the problem with evil is really a problem with how to love. I feel so, yes. Okay. yes. The two are correlated because right. when, you, when we examine the, at the beginning, do you remember? Mm -hmm. At the beginning, we saw that most of us believe love has no power. Right. And most of us believe that evil is the only thing with power. Mm -hmm. And because of this basic underlying belief that we have, when we consider love combating evil, we go, well, how is that going to be the case? We don't believe it can be. And that's our part of our issue. So part of our problem is what we define love to be. Mm -hmm. right? right? And that's part of our problem. And that's the reason why we've never seen evil combated on the planet. So over the th hundreds of thousands of years now that men have been on the planet, what we see is this belief that now many, many of us would hope that that's not true, and we hope that this is true. That's what we hope. But if you look at the reality on the planet, it's really the other truth, isn't it, at the moment. And so what we've got to do is find out what kind of a love is it going to be before love actually rules. We need to really analyse ourselves to see what, uh, what kind of love is going to be necessary within me before I have the power to change evil on the planet. That's the question we all need to ask ourselves. The kind of, what is the kind of love? What, what is the qualities and characteristics of this love that we are going to need in order for evil to be changed? In order for evil to not be honoured anymore as the ruler? Yeah. Um, I found out in these four years that when I do the right thing, not only it's not... Um, recognized but I get more rebuked for it or more hatred for it a lot of projections for it and it feels really hard to do the right thing or the loving thing or the truthful thing it feels so hard to tell the truth so hard to be loving well I would put to you that if it's real love <coughs> that won't be the case if it's love that is tainted with addiction then whenever we act upon the love tainted with addiction, we'll get a response, and if the response isn't what we want, then we'll feel hurt. So this is where we've got to think about those things, that, like what is real love of self? What, what is involved in the real love of self? What is real love of others? So... Does real love of others feel hurt when another person doesn't accept it? No. But often our love feels like that, doesn't it? When we, we, we love somebody and we can feel them rejecting our love, what do we feel? 
often we feel hurt. So that tells me it's not real love. Right? And what does the real love of truth, what is that going to demand of us? If we really love truth. In every single circumstance, in every single situation, without any limitations, what will that do to us? That's what we've got to consider. Yes. I found it interesting that when you had up the th uh, thing about good versus evil and righteous violence versus unrighteous, you weren't just describing Hollywood, you were describing Christianity. Exactly. Which basically says that if you have a lesser sin like working on a Sunday or not being a virgin on your wedding day, that the cure is actually the greatest sin of murder. And not yes. just murder, but being stoned to death. Yes. So even our most loving example, which is supposed to be Christianity, believes at its core that you can overcome maybe lesser evil with stronger, more powerful evil. Spot on. And almost every religious faith on this planet believes the same thing. Yeah. So, so we obviously have to change our concept of love. We have to, have to get, you know, that concept that we began with today, we have to get that concept of love and we've got to grow from that concept. We've got to start seeing what real love would do not the love that we've all experienced in our lives would do. See, the love we've all experienced in our lives has very many limitations, and it's not the love we're talking about that's able to control, that's able to um, look after and, and eventually eradicate evil. We're going to need a different type of love. So what we need to do is discover what type of love it is that we're going to need. How the t this type of love, this new type of love, has more power than any other force. We need to, it needs to somehow have so much power that we, even within ourselves, remember I said in this discussion, when we have evil, we're perpetrated against us, we often resort to one of those three or four things that we mentioned, like fight, flee, or, or freeze, or as Mary mentioned, pandering. And the real love has to be greater than those things as well doesn't it, for it to be effective. So, so how are we going to get it? How is it going to... It needs to be something that changes in here too. It can't be an intellectual response because the problem with an intellectual response is you put us in a stressful situation and all the intellect that we had up until then goes out the window. Yeah. Right? In a stressful situation, what is really in your soul is going to be the driving force. So... so the real love that we need needs to be something that transforms us in our heart so much that it drives our very action even under stress. So even if we're stressed out, it will still drive the same action. Does that make sense? So that's the kind of love that I like to think about. What kind of love do you, are we going to need that, that it's so strong that evil will not prevail against it? Does that make sense? Would you be able to do that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That'd be great. Um, I'd like to thank you guys to get to the, today for your um, for your time in particular. Um, sure. Okay. Is it on the subject or? Did it... uh, no, I think it is. Yeah. I, this is this is the first time I'd ever I I got word of this yesterday. This is my first time to ever visit, so I'm a little. And I think it's such a, a neat message about love. Yeah. I'm just I got derailed by a couple of things that you said sure. that I was confused about, and the first one was. And just two things. The first one was um, spirit friends, or and you said something about a sixth dimension, and I'm confused. Okay. okay. And, and my suggestion for anybody who's confused about some of the terms that I've just used right. is to watch a video that's on YouTube okay. that I've done. It's called The Secrets of the Universe. <coughs> If you look on YouTube, um, there's a thing called Divine. Uh, it's called Divine Truth Channel. So. A friend of mine has put it on there. Okay. Divine Truth Channel. Okay. And on there, there'll be a there'll be a list of different talks and discussions, and one of them will be the secret of the universe. There's there's four parts to it. All together, it's nine hours, unfortunately. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make some popcorn. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so there's part one and part two to it. I think he covered it part one. 
And 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 then there's a Q and A where people okay. will ask questions. So I go with the part one first and then the part two. Okay. Now in the part one and part two, I outline the basic structure of the universe and the basic and what happens when you die and a number of other things in that process. And it describes a lot of the basic principles of what I'm describing. And then okay. and then you can use that as a basis to understand a lot of other things. And so my suggestion for anybody who has found a bit of a struggle with some of the things I've mentioned today to look at that talk. Okay. Yeah. And it d goes into the, the, the spirits, the friends. It goes friends. into the spirits. <laughs> the spirits. Uh, there are both friends and... Okay, and then my other question was, because this is what actually what got me here, which I thought was very intriguing, but that's why, I mean, that's why I'm here, because I didn't know if you were going to talk about you or any of that, but I wanted to know, because you had mentioned talking in the first century, yeah. and so that part, and that was the part of your website that got me too, and that's why I'm here, so oh, okay. I just, you hadn't told, or I, I just, I was curious about that. Okay, and um, yeah, just that I'm Jesus, you mean, or? Yes. Yeah. And I don't talk about it that much. Um, <laughs> in comparison with all the talks that I've given, uh, that's not something that's... There are talks that I've given that are on the YouTube site that are about being Jesus. Uh -huh. um, and there are also... Um, there's also some interviews that are present there that probably listen Jeff to. Whitehead. The Jeff Whitehead interview is on YouTube as well. Okay. He, it's called a Jeff Whitehead. Just is a is a school teacher in Australia. Okay. <laughs> who interviewed myself and Mary, and in that interview, he just asked me some basic questions. It's the first session, session one, and he just asked me some basic questions about my identity and all those kind of things that you probably pay to listen, pay to watch as well. Okay. Yeah, and in terms of from. But my perspective, it's not an important issue. It's obviously an important issue for me, because I know who I am, but I don't feel it's an important issue for other people. Oh, so. it was huge for me if that were the truth. Oh, Growing up, true. knowing yeah, and true. accepting Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, that would be huge. So to, yeah. you know, you, I mean, and you knew, because you knew about Christianity and, of course, you know, what we learn about here, <laughs> how it is, um, and then obviously how this goes off with the Bible, what, which I was taught was the truth. That's why I was so intrigued. I just wanted to know yeah. what that, I mean, obviously, I was, I mean, that's, yep. that's why I'm here. Yep, no worries. Well, if you listen to that interview, because um, many of the other people have already done that, so that's why okay. that. So um, if you listen to that interview, um, you'll get a background of, of what I'm saying about my identity, um, and if you listen to that, and if you listen to that presentation, you'll get a background of the basic teachings that I'm teaching in terms of a very quick overview of all the teachings. Okay. And then on YouTube, there's uh, I think there's about 500 hours or so of okay. other talks, mm -hmm. but but I'm not suggesting okay. you listen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, but that will give you an idea, and this will give you an idea of what I'm saying, um, rather than addressing it now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right? No, I, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank Not you. Um, that sequence is in 2010, right? This one, yeah, was in... No, well, in 2009 in September. Uh, is it? No, no it's... Oh, it's in 2010. I think it was 10, wasn't it? Yeah, it was 2010. Yeah, it was 2010. 10 in September. I think the date of it is... 26 and 27. 26 and 27. I have a 9. I have a 9. Anyway, see, you can see how some of them are. <laughs> 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 they, they know which better way. <laughs> but I think it's 2010, 09, 26, which is 26 of September 2010. Oh, okay. Leave that button. Um, that's the one to probably listen to, and then, and then the question and answer the next day. What happened was there was uh, 200 people in an audience who listened to the presentation, and on the next day, many of them came along and asked lots of questions about it. So the Q&A is their question. And that was in Australia. That was so in Australia. I was in the wrong country. Got it. Okay. <laughs> All right. I've given the same talk in the States many times, actually. I was in Florida. Right, this is 2008. Eight. Yeah, and gave a talk to... Uh, quite a lot of people. In fact, we did a series of talks in Florida. We've Have you thought about coming back and doing it again? And we, myself and Mary, just respond to the desires of people in an area. We don't, mm -hmm. so we don't market anything. 
we don't uh, we don't we, we go by donations because right. that's the only way we can travel, and uh, and so we, we've got we've not no way of gauging an interest in a location until somebody actually tells us that they're interested, mm -hmm. and then we come based on the desires of people. That's where we go everywhere in the world, basically. So, so in the, this trip here, we've been to Athens, to to London, and to Sweden and Gothenburg, and and they are all from people who have just asked us to come, basically. Okay. So we can come back to places. It just depends on how much people want us to, basically. Okay. And our personal circumstances, of course. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we do that. We do that all the time in Australia too, this. so we go around different places in Australia as well. Yeah. Okay. AJ, can I ask a question of the audience? Of the audience. audience? Well, Patricia and I don't have a place to stay yet, so right. we thought maybe we'd split the cost of a, a room in the hotel or something like that. Right. So yep. if anybody wants to offer that room. Yeah, now, there was somebody who said that... I do have an extra queen size bed if you guys want to stay there. Really? It's not here, though. Oh. the best western. Is it um, three miles from here? About three miles. I won't get lost finding it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can follow me. Okay. Does anybody have a room here in the hotel? A lot of them here are taken up, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> well, we'd sure like to hook up with you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your time with us today. Yeah. And thank you. Thank you. Mary just wants to mention some things. Uh, just that there's a, a cameraman and a journalist here from Channel 9 in Australia, and they've asked if any of you would be interested in speaking to them. I said that was completely up to you. I gave them permission to film AJ because I knew he wouldn't care, but they also told me that they wouldn't be filming you um, without your permission. So, just so you know, that's there. Yep. Thank you. And was there anything else? No, that's it. No Thanks for a great day. It's good to meet you guys. Yeah. <laughs>